The Triathlon Show 255. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview coach Conrad Geringer of workingtriathlete.com and Rob Sleemaker, founder of Vasa Trainers. Conrad and Rob have together co-authored the newly released book, Triathlon Freestyle Simplified, and uh, the contents of that book form the discussion points of today's episode. We will simply discuss how triathletes can get the most out of their swim training, even on what is typically a very limited time budget when it comes to swimming especially. But before we get into that interview, big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Precision Hydration create electrolyte supplements in different strengths, so you can match the supplement to how much sodium you lose in your sweat, because this can vary uh, quite a lot from individual to individual. On the lower end of the scale, you might be losing less than 500 milligrams per liter of sweat, and on the higher end, you might be losing up to 2,000 milligrams per liter of sweat. And then when you add to that the fact that people sweat in very different rates, uh, you can have uh, very, very large differences from individual to individual in how much sodium and electrolytes it, you need to replace. So Precision Hydration can help you do that. Just take their free online sweat test and that will give you uh, a, a hydration strategy for racing and training. And you can get 15% off your order with the promo code DATTRIATHLONSHOW15. And big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka are the world leading manufacturers of wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. They are the, a super innovative company with many patents and uh, unique innovations, including things like the Geeko anti slip technology uh, that they use on all their glasses and sunglasses. They have uh, the arms of technology in their wetsuits and many, many other uh, small details that make your performance better when you use their products in training and racing. You can get 20% off your order with a promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Conrad Geringer and Rob Sleemaker. Welcome back to that Triathlon Show, Conrad and Rob. How are you doing today? Doing well. How are you? Good, thanks. And Rob, you? Yeah, very well. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be back. So both of you have been on the show before, but uh, can we just maybe give a very quick uh, synopsis of who you are and and also mention the name of your recent book, which uh, is kind of the the topic of today's conversation. Conrad, why don't you start? Sure. So uh, I am Conrad Geringer, and I'm a triathlon coach based out of Nashville, Tennessee, in the United States. Uh, I uh, founded a company called Working Triathlete and wrote a book called The Working Triathlete a couple of years ago, and recently co-wrote with Rob Sleemaker, Triathlon Freestyle Simplified. Yeah, and uh, that's the book that uh, we'll have linked in the show notes and everything, and, and yeah, the topic of today's discussion. Uh, Rob, uh, fill in the blanks on uh, your background for listeners that may not remember back to our first interview, which was um, two or almost three years ago now, I think. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Sleemaker, and I live in uh, Underhill, Vermont. I'm the founder and owner of Vasa Incorporated, or better known as VasaTrainer.com, where we make uh, swim-specific and sport-specific exercise equipment. Uh, but my background um, in sports really started as an exercise physiologist. I, I have an advanced degree in exercise physiology from University of Arizona, and I was fortunate enough to get involved with uh, some elite level endurance uh, Nordic skiers, biathletes, triathletes, cyclists, runners, et cetera, when I um, moved to Vermont. And that led to my first two books. Uh, the first one is Serious Training for Serious Athletes. And the second um, book that I co-authored with uh, my colleague, Ray Browning, was called Serious Training for Endurance Athletes. And then I took a hiatus from writing books for quite some time and had the great fortune to um, pick up Conrad's 
book, The Working Triathlete. And coincidentally, after I got that book and was devouring it, I found out that he actually had purchased a, a Vasa Swimmerg. And so we started connecting and and uh, I, I enjoyed his style of writing so much and his uh, his brutal efficiency, if you will, with re- with regard to the way he puts forth complicated uh, notions and makes them simpler. Um, so I approached him and and said, "Hey, Conrad, I've had this idea for a book for some time. How about we put our heads together?" And uh, the end result is uh, Triathlon Freestyle Simplified, the new book for us. Great, uh, that's uh, that's a great overview. And uh, yeah, we talked about uh, with Conrad on uh, your interview. We talked about training for the working triathlete for busy triathletes. So uh, that will also link to in the show notes, of course. And Rob, when you were on, we discussed Vasa and uh, the the equipment that you make, the the erg and the traditional Vasa trainer. For people that uh, have no clue what they are, you can think of them as a treadmill for swimming, uh, I guess. So, uh, and you have with the swimmer, you also have the built-in power meter, which is really cool. So that's the discussion of, of that interview, which will be linked to as well. But let's get into the swimming topic that we have uh, for today. And uh, if we start with, uh, go back to Conrad again, uh, can you uh, describe what you think are the, the challenges that triathletes face uh, compared to pure swimmers when it comes to, uh, to swim training? Yes, so the biggest issue that triathletes face, especially age groupers, um, is just lack of time. And most triathletes, they they face unique challenges in that oftentimes they don't have extensive swim backgrounds, so they're going to have anatomical limitations. They're going to have inflexible joints. So, you know, their, their shoulders aren't going to be super flexible. Oftentimes their ankles aren't flexible. If they're adult learned swimmers, then they're not going to have that same proprioception in the water that, um, you know, individuals who learned how to swim as children have, if you're growing up, you, and you, it's amazing when you watch younger swimmers in the water, how fast they can go and how they take to it, something happens. And, Adult swimmers, when they when they if they're aiming to build proficiency and and learn how to swim well as adults, oftentimes they're robotic in the water, and um, you know so that's a challenge as well. Uh, so it is the main issues would be lack of time and then certain anatomical limitations, but there's also this variable in, in triathlon where triathletes, they, they're essentially endurance swimmers um, and they're specifically open water endurance swimmers. So there are certain unique approaches that you know, ideally one takes to, to get better specifically at open water distance swimming. So, so there are potentially unique ways that triathletes should view swim training uh, that might be different than the traditional you know, swim training model. All right. So, um, so let's, let's perhaps uh, get into that uh, unless you have anything to add. And then uh, perhaps Rob wants to take uh, that uh, next, uh, next step of uh, describing what are the differences that uh, comes up in terms of training focus uh, and uh, yeah, main objectives with the training for the triathletes, given these uh, limitations that we have. Well, I think one of the first um, things I, I would advise, um, especially an adult learned swim triathlete, but but really all triathletes, is identify the specific limiters to having an efficient um, swim technique or freestyle technique, and um, not just the, not, but not just the physical um, limiters, but also psychological the the mental training side of things the fears and and stuff but for the sake of this um podcast we'll talk more about the technical the swim technique side of things as well as the fitness side of things um and i think that um once someone understands what the limiters are 
in their body, then they can um, find, they can either research on their own or be coached by somebody to help understand what are the most efficient ways to either work with those limiters or overcome or improve on those limiters. And, and then um, really in, for lack of a better way to say it, throw out the rest. Like there's so many people do, uh, they, they jump into uh, maybe a group training session or a master swim program where they're training, um, you know, competitive pool athletes most of the time. And some of the drills that they do don't apply to uh, an open water swimmer that, you know, in open water conditions that a triathlete or a swim runner or, or even an open water swimmer will face. And so it's really important to distill the training, use only the relevant drills, um, prioritize the physiologic benefits um, that you're needing to, to gain um, for the specific events that you're going to be training. Can we and then can, can we exemplify and, this somehow? Do you perhaps you know somebody or Conrad might have somebody uh, that you're coaching that uh, that we can sort of take this discussion and apply it to what with the limiters of that person or what were and are the limiters of that person and how does that then inform the training? Just to make it a little bit more specific and tangible for listeners to uh, to follow along. Yes. So the the whole point in writing this book was to to try to simplify things and to create this sort of turnkey way in which triathletes can, can really approach the swim. And we, we sort of lay it out in the book. It's, so you have triathletes, obviously they are experiencing crossover fatigue and uh, they're generally time strapped. So they need to make the most of their swim training. So then the question becomes, okay, what, what does that look like? Well, you know, n- number one, uh, certainly because water is 800 times denser than air, Technique is extremely important. Um, you know, so step one, we would say at the beginning of each season would be to get with the coach, have them film you, identify the, the top three things that are inefficiencies in your stroke. And then, especially early in the, in the season, just attack those with brutal efficiency, identify drills that uh, will sort of allow you to, to, to isolate the parts of the stroke that are lacking so that you can uh, develop that and enhance that. And then after that, the question is, okay, once one is generally proficient in the water, well, how do you structure training? And the issue with triathletes is that it is difficult to, for them, especially when they're balancing cycling and running to get to the pool multiple times a week. Certainly you look at pro triathletes, all of those individuals, they're swimming five, six times a week. Uh, and it's just not practical for most age groupers to do that. Um, so then, well, the question becomes, okay, how do we structure a macro cycle? And uh, really to determine the, the best training structure, you really kind of have to look at the athlete and almost – walk backwards it's okay they have access to a pool how many times a week can they swim uh while still fostering cycling and run fitness uh and and how do we structure that and in this book we we spoke with numerous coaches all over the world uh and top athletes uh, about how they strategies they've used to with their triathletes to sort of maximize performance and get with a certain number of sessions, swim sessions per week. And par, the consensus is that swimming three times a week seems to be the, the sweet spot. Uh, one can gain fitness and, and actually progress if they're swimming three times a week. Um, and what do those sessions look like? Uh, it, It depends a little bit, I think, where one is in the macro cycle. At the beginning of the season, it it makes sense to sort of build up, just like cycling and running, slowly. So at at the beginning, you're you're sort of focusing on form and technique a little bit more. You're laying that foundation. And this is really a good time, as I kind of alluded to earlier, to to really focus on, on technique. So 
there, there's always an underlying sort of obsession with with making sure that you're efficient in the water. And then as the macro cycle progresses, uh, it makes sense just to move into this more of a high end fitness block where you're really looking to get strong in the water. Uh, and then in the last, as the race approaches, you know, traditional macro cycle evolution, you, you start getting more race specific. You start thinking about tactics, Op- open water swimming, especially is, I mean, that's the, the unique uh, way this one works in, in triathlon. So focus on sighting and swimming in a wetsuit, drafting, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I can go into how, what those specific workouts might look like uh, throughout that micro cycle. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, let's start perhaps with uh, the, just generally talking about the technique part. First of all, I want to highlight one thing you said there, uh, get together with your coach and get a video. And that's how you inform your technical top two or three priorities. I love that. Uh, that's uh, definitely something that I think is probably one of the best investments that any any a troop triathlete can can make in their triathlon progress and way too few actually do that and get a proper video and a and not just getting a video but actually getting it assessed by somebody who is used to looking at swimming and know what they should be looking for and can then give the right feedback to the athletes on what they should be working on why and how so so really wanted to highlight that that aspect but then if we have our technical limiters and points of improvement identified uh, then perhaps you can give uh, an, ex- an example of an athlete that that you work with and and then how do you work through that uh, again you mentioned focusing a lot on that in the early part of the season and then uh, fitness becomes more and more important and predominant later on but when you are working on the technical limiters what does that look like is it drills uh, is it just focusing on it in technique being like deliberate practice within your full stroke or what what do you propose there sure so so it's always about alternating so drilling is a great way to address specific form hitches but also alternating actually swimming you know in between the drills so i'm a big fan of um having a drill having an athlete do that drill for say 50 meters and then immediately swimming 50 meters just front crawl um and, and that allows them to actually apply what they're feeling when they're drilling to the swim stroke itself. Because, you know, drilling oneself into oblivion is not productive if it's not translating to your actual stroke. Um, so once, once we identify form limiters, then we pick the, the main, the main ones. Typically, if somebody's getting a, a form analysis video done, they're generally proficient. They often have certain flaws and certain flaws that I see frequently, probably the most common apart from just generally sinking legs is crossing over front when they're uh, entering. So when their hand enters, oftentimes it crosses their center line, which uh, just causes the body to sort of snake through the water. And that generates a lot of drag. So uh, a, a great drill to address that is swimming with a pool boy and snorkel with the ankle strapped and just having them focus on entering in line with their shoulder, reaching out, you know, getting into that catch phase and pulling back straight back efficiently. Um, another common stroke flaw might be they're showing their whole face when they're breathing. So a good drill to address that would be swimming with fins, uh, basically side kicking with an arm extended out front and then breathing with one goggle in the water while they're kicking. Um, and, and that just gets them a feel for keeping their head low when they're breathing. Uh, and the best time to do these, certainly a whole session could be devoted to addressing these form limiters. Um, but it also makes sense. And typically I would prescribe these drill sequences in as, as part of the warm up and, and preset. Um, and then still in the main set, still focusing on just, just swimming and, and building fitness. Um, if, if I might jump in on, on something you said, Conrad, um, I, I'm a person who I really need to understand why 
something, what, you know, why someone is advising me to do something or, or, or whatever. And so you, you mentioned about minimizing, you know, this, it's the importance of, of the athlete understanding why it's important to minimize drag and why it's important to maximize propulsion. And I think one of the things about this book that we've really tried to do, uh, um, I'm kind of coming up from a 20,000 foot level now, is we've tried to meet the athlete where they are in terms of their technique, their their fitness, their goals, where they want to go, but also their available time, their life logistics. And in order to help them um, perform consistent training that's the highest quality and effectiveness possible for that individual athlete. So even going back to, you know, starting with having your coach video tape you and identify your limiters, that, that's like, that's another piece of starting where that athlete is. And then the same applies to, you know, whether they whether they're, um, have pool availability or, um, you know, the, the other crossover fatigue factors and things like that. I'm not, I don't mean to go off on a tangent here, but I think it's really important for people to understand that it all comes back to um, minimizing, you know, learning how to minimize drag while you're swimming and maximizing your propulsion. And so wherever that athlete is at the moment, we want them to improve, but they've got to start with those. Right. Basic it's concepts. Always, and triathletes especially are uh, oftentimes guilty of, overcomplicating everything and it's it's actually interesting having coached uh, dozens and dozens of athletes uh triathletes love to sort of pick apart the swim especially as it relates to technique and and that's good you know it, it's essential to have an efficient swim stroke and to reduce drag and technique is incredibly important it's essential to you know be efficient in the water um but oftentimes these same athletes don't swim hard and then they wonder why they aren't progressing or they don't spend time actually building fitness. So yes, reducing drag is important, but so is building, have, building the strength so that you can have a good propulsive pool. Uh, so, you know, certainly form is important, but so is fitness because it's fitness that actually allows you to maintain that feel for the water so that you can real, you can actually productively swim and, and really build that proprioception and hold your technique over distance. Um, oh, go ahead, Rob. And, yeah, and to that to that point, Conrad, um, one of the most profound things that I learned from um, Coach Eric Nielsen was this notion of um, especially adult learned swimmers. Um, swimming with what, what he calls a mono speed pull, which essentially is, you know, you could have someone who's really efficient. They look, they look very good in the water. They're, they're minimizing drag with a, with a nice long taut body line. But as they, as their arm, their hand and arm enter the water and they pull, they, they, they're pulling to get to that catch position, that hand speed is moving at a certain speed and you don't want it to be, super fast when or or with a lot of power when you're pushing down on the water because that just makes your body go up in the water but as soon as you get into that vertical forearm the fingertips to the elbow sort of pointing in the direction toward the bottom of the of the pool or or the water um then when they get to that catch position they've set the lats and that's when you want to pull with for lack of a better way to say it explosiveness and pull from the catch to the finish. But a lot of adult learned swimmers, they pull with the same exact hand speed from enter entering the water all the way to the finish of the stroke. And when they when someone swims with a monospeed pull, they are not engaging the the muscles in the the torso that are used, you know, used um, in rotation properly. They're also not engaging the large muscles of the back, the lats and the up and the upper back, which when you can engage the large muscles of the, of the back for propulsion, you save the small muscles of the shoulder and arm so that those little niggle muscles don't get fatigued. So I, that was one of the most profound things that I thought was 
um, something that that every athlete should try to identify is that a limiter for me right now am i swimming with a mono speed pull and if i am i better figure out how to fix that and and rob i think you'll find this funny but that thing you just uh, discussed about the mono speed pull is the one thing that uh, right i still to this day remember super clearly from our interview two and a half three years ago that, that's uh, if somebody would have asked me what's the the number one tip you got from rob in that interview that's i could have said that with like without any hesitation and uh, so i'm glad you brought that up again because i i have found it a, a tremendously valuable uh, piece of advice uh over the years since swimming well again credit credit where credit is due that that came from coach eric nielsen who is a master a masterful coach uh out in colorado and so i thank him for that tip when when it comes to so we have talked about like the importance of both technique and fitness and doing some hard swimming uh one thing that uh often comes up and uh that i'm always curious to hear is what is sort of the point like when somebody might actually be is there such a point where somebody is, is too slow to to do hard swimming and if so what is that point what is the pace where like really you just need to focus mostly on technique and to be to be honest maybe it's an unnecessary question because for people that are swimming that slowly let's say you're swimming 230 per 100 meters or something all swimming is kind of hard <laughs> that, but uh, i guess if you want to elaborate a bit on that that thought and that discussion point then what would you sure. say i mean i think that it, at the beginning when if somebody is truly learning how to swim and their technique is so horrendous it's one of those you sort of know it when you see it type things and until one has the ability to until they're comfortable in the water that's number one and uh, and their body position is is decent it doesn't really make sense to do you know t-pace threshold work it, it doesn't make sense to do super high intensity work until one has general proficiency what is that on a per pace per hundred basis it's it's probably around two minutes per hundred meters um but you know, certainly if somebody just doesn't, if they're not strong or, or something like that, then, you know, it's, it does not exclude anybody from, you know, if their cruise pace is 210 or 220 per hundred, it's, but their body position is decent and they don't have any glaring stroke flaws. I think it's still fine to really focus on, on building fitness. But I do think that there often is a little bit of a, in the triathlon community and, and overemphasis on perfecting technique while ignoring fitness. Um, but, you know, as a general rule, I would say those that around two minutes per hundred is probably the cutoff. Uh, Michael, I, I, I might add to, to what Conrad is saying is that, you know, again, the, Aside from how their 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 speed at which they're swimming, um, the to me the most important thing is if someone has the desire to do it and they want to improve, then again let's meet them where they are. And if someone is swimming that slowly in the water, I think one of the first things that I would do, and I, I've learned this from watching other coaches, is try to identify what those limiters are, and then let's isolate some things. So one of, to me, one of the things that um, I think it's really valuable. Conrad mentioned this a bit earlier in the in the conversation, but let's eliminate some variables. For example, kicking, and let's get that athlete in the water as long as they're comfortable with their face in the water and 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 those and breathing and and things like that. Um, let's let's just work on on uh, you know have give them a pull buoy and an ankle strap and ideally a front mount snorkel if they can tolerate that. So now you're eliminating a lot of the variables and it allows them to focus on um, getting their body line long and taut and then learning about how to maximize propulsion with their arm stroke and just focus on those things and then slowly remove some of those other tools and toys. But but the, again, the getting this concept of minimizing drag why it's so important to do that and, and they'll start to see the benefit of that right away um in the book we use an analogy and, and i think this is the right time to mention it if you if you if someone knows um what a racing 
car, uh, carbon fiber kayak, or even, you know, you can take a rowing shell, if you will. They're really long and pointy and very stiff. And if you, if you held one of those carbon fiber racing kayaks, um, in the water, pointing right out to sea, and you push that thing with, with, um, a lot of might, it's going to just glide really easily out into the water. And to contrast that, take an inflatable kayak and do the same thing where you push the end of the kayak and you push this kayak out into the water. As soon as you push on that inflatable kayak, all this energy is lost into the, the fact that this is not a long, taut vessel. So if I could impart anything on listeners is try to get your body to be a long, taut vessel that g- glides through the water with as little drag as possible. And until you can learn that concept, you're, you're going to struggle because you're, when you're kicking, your feet are going to, your legs are going to splay to the side. Uh, you might be snaking in the water. Connor had mentioned that before. There might be like a serpentine kind of motion for your body. And all of those things can be addressed, but you have to understand whether they need to be addressed in your particular um, technique yes. at the moment. Yeah, uh, that, that's a great point. And I, I want to follow up on that because I think this is related. But uh, when you mentioned swimming with a pool boy and an ankle strap, uh, because I think that a few, few of the listeners might not even know that ankle straps for swimming exist. So first of all, can you just give a very brief overview of what they are and then uh, tell us why do you use them when you're swimming with the pool boy? Sure. Um, so ankle straps are essentially bands that you put around your ankles and they keep your ankles together uh you can use it's common to recommend that athletes use a an old tire a cycling tire inner tube um but basically i mean you can buy them on online for or from a swim store uh basically what the reason that we would recommend using that if you're swimming with the pool boy is uh, especially if you're kind of having issues serpentining through the water um, is that it prevents one from scissor kicking and scissor kicking in the water or that outward splay of the leg is usually a symptom of crossing over your center line upon entry so you kind of kick out to counteract that the momentum that you create when you cross over your center line up front and what that does is it creates drag and you want to minimize drag obviously when you're swimming so one kind of heuristic that we we like to stress when one is thinking about okay how do i maintain good technique when i'm swimming is do that which allows you to maintain alignment in the water Every, almost every flaw, stroke flaw swimming is something that you're doing with your body that breaks that long top body line. Um, you know, Rob's rowing shell analogy is, is perfect. Um, the idea is to literally emulate a rowing shell when you're swimming. And the reason that we recommend swimming with a pool boy and, and a, uh, your ankle strapped uh, is because it, it automatically puts you in that good streamlined position with your legs sort of parallel to the surface of the water. And it allows athletes to, to feel what that feels like. Cause then when you remove that, you know, you want to kind of strive to, to get into that body position and engage your glutes and hamstrings and, and engage your core so that, you know, you lift up those legs, you don't break at, at your waist. Um, but again so going back to the ankle strap what that does is if if you're if you are crossing over center it's going to feel very uncomfortable if your ankles are strapped together because you can't splay out that leg so then you'll start adjusting your swim stroke you know you'll enter your hand will enter in line with your shoulder and it'll go into the cash position and pull straight back without crossing over your center line um it will do that kind of naturally. So it just kind of forces you to swim with uh, the correct form. Um, so it, it is beneficial in, in that way. And there are other uses for that ankle strap. Uh, one common drill is to have athletes literally just swim. So remove the pool boy and have them swim 
across the pool with the their ankle strap. And what that does is it, it really requires one to have either great natural body position. Uh, so they have to have the ability to keep their legs up kind of naturally and float with their body horizontal to the surface. Uh, and or it requires a, uh, a, a higher stroke turnover. So it to keep your legs up, you'd have to swim. You remove the dead spots in your stroke. Um, so it, it, oftentimes, especially you know, people who focus on gliding and minimizing their number of strokes to get across the pool, they'll have sort of a long catch-up style stroke, and that often leads to dead spots where there's deceleration and they're stalling in the water and. Uh, swimming with your ankle strap can also kind of teach you to put out a constantly, consistently propulsive pool uh, and remove those dead spots. Yeah. And uh, just one thing that I want to highlight there for listeners that you mentioned, uh, but just so nobody missed that is uh, the concept of swimming with great alignment. So entering uh, with the hand into the water in line with your shoulder and then just pulling straight back essentially is what you what you meant by that and yeah that that is a a great heuristic to to have um perhaps we can go into the the structure of training a little bit so rob do you want to jump in here and perhaps start with uh how to structure a workout for uh, and then we'll move up to sort of the uh, the periodization level but if we start with just on the on the workout level uh, how should a workout for the demographic we're talking about the time strapped athletes be uh be be structured actually i think I, i'll have conrad address that if you don't mind all right yeah sure yep. so a typical workout i mean i think the thing to remember here is that the, up front is that the main set is sort of the most important part of the workout that's what advances fitness um but the best way to structure a warm-up is to get a or, or workout is basically warm-up then a preset with drills then you have your main set which is sort of the main core of the workout that uh really is that that that's what defines the workout and then after the main set you do a cool down so a warm-up personally i'm a fan of having athletes do fairly long warm-ups usually they're around 800 meters and um, they're during the warm-ups it's a great time to really focus on technique um, and it, it also makes sense to integrate drills into the warm-up so that as an athlete is, is warming up they aren't just swimming front crawl or, or uh, just mindlessly swimming um, you can strategically do your drills and facilitate that warm up so that you know warming up obviously it dilates the uh, the blood vessels and it primes the body for the the harder work to come and so so after that warm up which is just easy very easy swimming and some drilling uh, let's do a a preset and other times that 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 preset might contain drills or the preset is ju- it might be harder swimming to so short intervals to they're kind of, it's kind of like drills and strides in that you uh, are getting the body ready for uh, the main set, which is usually the main set. There's a defined goal. Uh, if it's an endurance swim, then you know the intervals would obviously obviously be be longer at, at lower intensity. If 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 it's a, a tpe swim threshold swim, then you know, you typically have the main set would be it depends on the athlete and the volume that they're able to accomplish. But usually around 1000 to 2500 meters, it would be the, the full main set. And, and, you know, that's the main uh, purpose of the workout. And then the cool down, just a couple hundred meters of just easy swimming. Um, and that's the general structure. Yeah, and and in that example with the the threshold swim, one thousand to two thousand five hundred, that would be broken up into into intervals, uh, obviously. Uh, but uh, yeah, so let's zoom out then, and uh, and assuming that we go with this three swims per week structure that you mentioned, and I agree, I think that that's where you can actually 
uh, see some improvements. Uh, what would a typical week look like in terms of which what kinds of workouts you you add there for free workouts? Sure. So when we think about workouts, I like to think of them in four separate categories. So first category, say the endurance type workout, and typically that's composed of uh, intervals that are around 400 meters or longer. Um, and the, the purpose of that is to uh, build general endurance and teach the athlete to maintain form over distance. And then the second type of workout would be the intensity slash speed workout. So this is going to be harder efforts, usually 100 meters or less. Um, typically faster than threshold pace. So you want to really be swimming at this pace in competition or in a triathlon. Uh, and then a third type of workout would be the threshold workouts, the T pace workouts. And, and this, it, it, these workouts in my opinion are among the most important on an ongoing basis for triathletes because in you're essentially swimming on the rivet here and you keep the rest short and um, it's, it's a little bit faster than one's Olympic distance uh, swim pace. Um, and then the fourth category is, is kind of a catch all technical category. And this includes just form focus sessions or tactics focus sessions like, open water uh, where you're focusing on open water tactics or focusing on a, a stroke flaw. Um, but so those are the four types of workouts, but to get to your original question, how to, if there's three swims a week, how do you allocate it? It, it depends a little bit on where one is in the macro cycle, but on an ongoing basis, triathletes should be swimming fairly hard, fairly often. Um, but at the beginning of the macro cycle, the duration of, of the main set should be slightly shorter, but it's still reasonable to do light threshold work um, early, early on in the season. So I would always have two of the three swims containing you know, some type of intensity. Uh, the main set would be around – it would contain intervals around threshold or – slightly faster and then that it is good for one of those weekly workouts to be an, an endurance focused workout um where you're, you're swimming longer and throughout all of this you're always focused on on form and technique uh but so the evolution of the macro cycle at the beginning you know have one endurance focused slash form focused workout and then two light threshold workouts and then in the middle of the macro cycle when you're really focusing on building fitness it's good to have two of those workouts contain intensity so at threshold pace or greater for two of those workouts and then always maintaining that third workout as having an endurance focused uh, uh, essence right great and uh follow-up question how long should workouts be sort of on average for the type of athletes that we're talking about here uh, that are swimming three times per week? Uh, do you have a typical guideline in terms of whether it's distance or duration? Distance, of course, might vary a bit depending on the ability of the swimmer uh, or and duration might still. So however you prefer to define it. Sure. Uh, 2,500 meters for most athletes is kind of the sweet spot. That's something that they could accomplish in around 60 minutes. Uh, and the demographic that we're, we're thinking about here is, is triathletes who uh, are trying to maximize performance efficiently. And certainly it is not a bad thing to swim more. Um, but 2,500 meters just is the default, I think, sort of ideal duration there. Uh, many athletes can can swim 3,000 meters total in, in 60 minutes. And, uh, you know, I also work with athletes. The typical session is, is 4,000 meters. But 
they generally have swim backgrounds and, and you know, they're, they also swim much faster. Um, but as a general rule, if we're looking to simplify and just sort of maybe oversimplify, I would say that 2,500 meter uh, session is, is probably the, the best on an ongoing basis. However, we can't forget that training does need to reflect the demands of the race. So for if somebody, if their A race is an Ironman, you have to respect the distance and you know, a, a 2.4 mile swim, it, it requires one to uh, have very good swim fitness and, and endurance. And typically for Ironman athletes, uh, the most important where we really build that endurance is in sort of the last phase of the macro cycle. So it's not like throughout an entire macro cycle, which might be 20 weeks or so, an athlete should be swimming 4,000 meters each session to sort of mimic the length of that, that race it's, but over the last say six weeks, it, it does make sense to, you need to increase the volume a little bit. Um, so, you know, the specific duration of the sessions, it, it also kind of evolves and it has to be tailored to the race and the athlete. Yeah. Perfect. And, uh, then when when it comes to actually executing the workouts you mentioned the four categories there so uh you have the threshold the speed work faster and threshold and endurance how would you prefer to kind of uh, prescribe the intensity and then execute the workout do you work to target paces or rpe and if you work with paces what sort of testing would you use to establish that and so on so it Workouts typically prescribed in pace. Um, RPE is always a component of that. Certainly people have off days sometimes. and uh, But the way that I like to establish intensity zones is with the, the 3 by 300 test. So an athlete would essentially do, do a field test composed of uh, a set of three 300s with a 30-second rest interval. They should do that at the best average pace that they can hold for the 300 meter intervals. And you perform that test and then you, you look back and the average pace they held per hundred for all three of those 300s is their threshold pace or their T pace. Um, it's similar to a critical swim speed CSS. There's, there's a, it gets at a similar pace per hundred and that's zone four and zone three would be whatever that pace is. And then you basically add five seconds uh, per hundred to that base number. So for the three by 300 meter test, they held the average 130 per hundred meter pace. Then zone three would be 135. Zone two would be 140 per hundred. Uh, and Basically, we, we, we typically key off of that uh, sort of five zone model um, and everything kind of keys off of that, that T pace. So for a threshold workout, the goal for the athlete I just described, whose T pace was 130, uh, you know, pretty typical workout might be 12 by 100 meters uh, with 10 second wet rest at 130 per hundred. So in that workout, you know, the first few intervals, 100 meter intervals might feel pretty easy, but then as the workout progresses, because the rest is so short and they're swimming at threshold pace, it, the workout does get harder. Um, and by the end of it, they should be ready to <laughs> cool down. Um, but so typically, you know, it's, it's the workouts are prescribed based on, on pace. And uh, that example uh, brings up another point that uh, I always find fascinating to discuss, which is work to rest ratios in swimming. And you mentioned they're 12 by 100 with 10 second rest. So if you swim the 100s in 130, then you basically have a 9 to 1 uh, work to rest ratio there. So it's a threshold workout. So uh, in theory, it should be uh, very doable because you're not 
exceeding your sustainable pace. Uh, but then, of course, if you're even slightly overestimating your threshold, then you might run into into big trouble. But generally speaking, when it comes to work rest ratios, and I think it becomes more important when you're doing the faster work above threshold. Uh, what, what's your view on that in in swimming? How any guidelines around that? Sure. So it's interesting when you get into the intensity, the higher intensity swim workouts. It's it really kind of depends on on the workout. If it's truly all out sprints, it is reasonable to take a, a very long <laughs> rest interval. I mean that that exceeds the duration of the interval itself. You know if somebody's a sprinter, a swimmer who focuses on swimming fast 50 or 100, those workouts, you know, sometimes they're, you, know, you swim a 50 and then you rest for, for five minutes. But for, for triathletes, if you're doing 50s, for example, um, there's no real reason to rest more than around 30 seconds. Um, so, so for the higher intensity or speed, workouts you know it does depend a little bit on the intent of the workout but i do like to prescribe 50s i'm a big fan of 50s especially for uh triathletes because it allows them to swim fast but also recover and the rest interval for for those oftentimes by default it ends up being about about 50 percent of the uh duration of the interval because a lot of athletes, they'll come in on, on the 40 and they'll leave on the 60. So if they're doing 50, so, so that is a 50% uh, work to rest ratio. And, and I think that that's reasonable for higher intensity workouts, um, especially for, for triathletes who don't need to be truly, truly sprinting across the pool all the time. Although it, it is, there's a time of place for that also develop the, that neuromuscular system, the nervous system, and, and the ability to just recruit those those muscles. Yeah. And that's there's a value to that, but on an ongoing basis, frankly, it's just not not that important for triathletes. Yeah, uh, Rob, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this, as uh, with your background in in exercise physiology as well. Uh, just because uh, this is where uh, with the two to one work to rest ratio, that's definitely something that is sort of in the uh, within the normal parameters of zone five work, usually like you see one to one, uh, between one to one and two to one as the work to rest ratios, meaning uh, if you were for one minute, you rest for 30 seconds to one minute. That's kind of the standard prescribed when you look at high intensity interval training, just generally speaking, not particularly swimming here. Uh, but uh, one trend that I do see in swimming in a lot of swimming workouts is that uh, in, in those high intensity workouts, quite often we actually end up with workouts where the work to rest ratio is quite a bit higher. So you might be asking the athlete to do like really hard 50s that are well faster than threshold at least. But then the work to rest ratio is maybe something like three to one. So you're actually getting very little rest. And that's something that I've been thinking about a lot in uh, the last year or so. I would say that wh why is swimming so different to, say, cycling and running, where we almost by default would take a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio, it, it feels like sometimes. So do you have any comments on that, Rob? Yeah, uh, thanks. A few, th a few thoughts go into this. Um, you know, in general, I, I would say, depending on the the time of year or how far away you are from your your key events, then, you know, in this is a gross generalization, but basically the work to rest ratio would be greater as you're further away from your key events. And as you get closer and closer to your key events, um, then that work to rest, work to rest ratio reduces, it gets, gets smaller, right? Or, or I might be saying this incorrectly, but basically the rest is it, you're reducing the rest as you get closer and closer to your key events, that's maybe the better. That's what I'm trying to convey yeah. here. Okay, so and de decreased work stress because and 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 because your 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 body theoretically, if the training is going well, uh, your body's adapting, and you're you're able to adapt to those higher intensity work intervals faster. You're able to clear waste product and lactate and, and get going again. But there's two there's two other things I would mention and and to guide people. One is Going back to what Conrad said about warm up and the value and importance of warm up, if you if you know you're going to be doing a threshold workout and you know high intensity intervals, 
that's the day that you want to make sure you do a very good warm up and you have that warm up end very close to when you start doing your your intervals your hard intervals and the the same applies in a race i've always been a big advocate of of a good warm up and end it as close to the start of your race as possible because basically for lack of a better way to say it, you've got all the juices flowing and every, all your engine is starting to to operate properly so that's the one thing. The second thing is you can during your rest interval you can you can pay attention to your we, we've been saying the the expression RPE which stands for um, relative perceived exertion and that's a way to just be mindful of how are you feeling during that rest interval and from one workout to the next as you progress through your training program theoretically your rest period the rest interval will decrease relative to the work interval. And second, your perceived exertion during that rest interval will also um, reduce. You, you will feel like it's less, less exertion. And those are two ways of monitoring whether your training is actually progressing. So, so there's my view on, on right. yeah. this. Uh, Conrad, do you have anything to add on that uh, work to rest ratio question that I had? No, I, I, I do, but I, I think that you bring up sort of an interesting point. And I, and I always wonder so, certainly in cycling, that if one is doing VO2 intervals, which might be similar to these, these 50s that we're talking about, or, or the higher intensity work that 100 meter repeats at a zone five intensity, it, it's not uncommon to have equal uh, work to rest intervals. And, and for swimming, I wonder how much of that, of the reason that the rest is often shorter than that is, is just tradition. I don't know of any controlled studies where, you know, they, they had, uh, they took swimmers and, and increased the, the rest maybe to, to that of maybe a, what a cycling workout would look like. Um, but if one, I mean, in high school, typically, or college, or if you go to a master's swim, yes, the, the rest interval is, is shorter on a relative basis to, you know, the cycling VO2 workout or something similar. Um, so it is a, an interesting concept. And, you know, maybe we've been doing it incorrectly just <laughs> as a, uh, uh, just as literally coaches and, and, and everybody, we're just looking at it incorrectly, but, um, there are other considerations, uh, you know, I mean, swimming is, is there something to do with the lack of impact that, or your heart rate oftentimes might not get as high, uh, swimming as it would on the bike. Um, so there might be other variables that sort of cause maybe swim coaches to, to prescribe shorter rest intervals uh, during high intensity swim sessions. But, you know, it's, it is an interesting yeah, question. And, and also in swimming, you would have passive recovery and in cycling or running, you would quite often have active recoveries, especially cycling. Uh, right. But I do think that from my perspective, I, I do think that a lot of tradition goes into this and, uh, and that at least to some extent, some, some workouts could be designed probably a bit better by think by thinking a bit more about like, what what we know from research about work to rest ratios in in general and apply that to swimming where, where it's not applied but let's move into uh tools and uh, swim toys uh, we have talked a little bit about the the pull boy and the ankle strap and and you mentioned the snorkel as well and some fins in the sidekick and drill uh, just generally speaking what are the tools that you really like prescribing uh, athletes to use and and why are they important you feel The, so yes, I think that the, I think fins are extremely important for triathletes, especially. Um, so most drills are done kicking and they require a propulsive kick and most triathletes do not have propulsive kicks. They have inflexible ankles and they can't generate a lot of propulsion that way. Uh, so by doing drills with fins, not only does it help loosen up those ankle joints so that maybe they can develop 
good kicks, but it also allows them to do the drills well. Um, you know, for example, the uh, the kick and switch drill where one is kicking on their side uh, with with fins or, or without fins, and then they they take two strokes and then they switch the side that they're kicking on. If one does not have a repulsive kick, it's just very difficult to accomplish that drill. Uh, so fins, they're great tools. The snorkel like, is good for really focusing on, uh, it removes the breathing phase of, of the stroke. So you can focus simply on good alignment in the water, entering and pulling correctly. Um, and the Vasa swimmer, I think, is a great tool. Um, so you mentioned it earlier, and obviously Rob is, is the expert on the Vasa. But when it comes to really building swim strength um, efficiently, the, the Vasa is it is a great, great tool. Um, and it allows you to build swim strength, but also focus on techniques. So you can focus on things like what is given my anatomical limitations and shoulder stiffness or flexibility, where can I get my hand and forearm paddle blade vertical? You know, maybe I'm not like Grant Hackett or some other pure swimmer who has incredible shoulder flexibility and can get my forearm vertical three feet in front of my head. Uh, maybe due to my flexibility, I can get a vertical right at the top of my head. It's, it's, that's good to know. And then you focus on really keeping it vertical throughout the pull phase and, and you know, pulling down to your hip. Um, but, you know, I would argue that the Vasa, especially when we think of swimming through the prism of how do I swim more, swim train more, uh, given as a triathlete, given my lack of time. It's, it's what is the path of least resistance to get it, getting in a good, productive swim session. Uh, the Vasa is nice because you can have it in your house and you can hop on it. And 30 minutes later, you accomplished a, a productive swim session and you didn't uh, go through the hassle and spend time that maybe you don't have uh, traveling to the pool, changing hopping in the water, just the logistics most of mostly travel and prep. It can be prohibitive for, for athletes. And th this is why oftentimes for triathletes, swimming sort of takes a back seat. It's because it's just tough to, there's a lot of time investment to just getting a workout done. So the VASA can help enhance consistency and frequency, which is really what leads to progress. There aren't, Certainly, there are, it's good to do certain workouts at certain times in, in the season, but what really gets one, what really leads to progress is just consistent training. And uh, the VASA sort of allows one to be more consistent with it. You know, if I could um, add to, to what Conrad is saying, it's sort of unrelated to VASA, but I, one of the things we say right at the outset of the book is to, is to get the reader to think about how do you want to feel when you exit the swim in your race? And ideally, you want to feel relaxed. You want to feel happy. You want to feel safe and satisfied. And then if you work backwards from that point of exiting the swim in your race, you know, how did things go during your swim? How did you, how were you when you towed that start line? How prepared were you? What did you do for the 12 to 24 weeks? prior to you know starting that start line and to to what to to add to what conrad said about consistency and this applies for cycling and running as well but you know consistency leads to confidence and i believe that especially in a triathlon swim confidence and preparedness leads to safety um, first and foremost but also you know just a a, a happier better swim and so bringing this back around to someone's training plan and specifically their swim training plan about meeting them where they are, it's so important to realize that 
you know, problems and challenges uh, about, you know, getting to a pool or uh, your, your pool availability, time, your time availability, all these things, they're just opportunities to use your creativity to solve that particular challenge or that particular problem. And so I would encourage the listeners to think this way and to do whatever they can to understand that the quality of their training over the long term, the quality of their training will cost them less. So it's very important and worthwhile to plan your training so that you can have quality focused preparation for the events that you want to do and and specifically in triathlon for swimming, cycling and running. So, you know, I encourage people to come back to their what what is your life like right now and what is realistic for you to do and if that means that you're really time crunched and you uh your pool is not available at the times that you want to get to or it's just plain a hassle and you don't want to go or whatever it is then look for other training tools that you can do at home or in your gym that supplement what you need to do in the water but that allow that consistency so that you can continue to be consistent in your preparation and that's going to lead to confidence yeah it make, makes a lot of sense and it's kind of comparable uh, in some ways at least to the proliferation of indoor bike training i mean of course we have uh climate and uh, the seasonal changes in weather as one of the reasons for the popularity some people might still be riding outdoors throughout the uh, the summer and uh late spring early autumn depending on where they live but but for others living in cities for example it's also just the the hassle of getting out to to good roads to ride on and uh, traffic and such being problems so uh, so yeah we have solved this with indoor bike training so i can definitely see the point that uh, yeah wait if uh, swimming takes up too much time with the commute and everything then and the pandemic has been a great example of course where a device trainer has probably been an invaluable tool, tool for some some lucky users that uh, that happen to have them or have been getting them through the pandemic and been able to train much better than uh, than most of the rest of us, I, I feel. So definitely makes a lot of sense. Uh, I have one, one final question that I want to get into, and that is around the open water focus that us triathletes must have. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, how, for example, open water training specifically might be easy to accomplish for some and not so much for others again depending on where you live uh, what can and should you be doing in the pool and so on do you want to go into that a little bit sure so open water swimming is is certainly different than pool swimming and that when you're swimming in a pool it's uh, it's very calm the surface is glassy and smooth and in an open water situation, uh, it's often choppy. You have to sight, um, and your perfect swim stroke that you spent months honing, uh, it's probably not going to look that perfect. And in fact, a perfect pretty swim stroke might not even be the most productive way to swim or the most efficient way to swim in, in open water. Um, so in open water, we think about... The, the tactics that one needs as a triathlete swimming in open water, they need to sight well. Um, and it's good to practice sighting frequently so that you know how to do it efficiently and, and you, you learn how to swim in a straight line. So um, practicing sighting year round is, is certainly reasonable. Um, and then other factors include drafting, drafting it saves a tremendous amount of energy in the water um so it, it's good to practice sighting it's good to practice drafting uh and one fact one interesting i think fact is that when one is swimming in open water and conditions are they don't even have to be rough they can be pretty standard open water conditions with a little bit of chop I think that there's a, a benefit to A, being strong, and B, to having a, uh, a higher turnover. Um, so you're just pulling more often. Um, in, in the pool, you can kind of get away with the longer catch-up style stroke 
if you even if you don't have a propulsive kick but in open water if you're not continuously generating propulsion with your kick and your turnover is slow you're going to be stalling a lot the chop and waves are going to um just prevent you from from moving or fo moving forward efficiently um so that's why it's good to maybe increase focus on increasing one's cadence and building strength because that perfectly symmetrical stroke when there are waves and people thrashing about you it it becomes more important to literally just have the ability to throw your arm forward um even if it's a straight arm recovery a lot of times that high elbow nice high elbow recovery that we can do in the pool it's tougher to do that in open water especially if you have a wetsuit sort of constricting your shoulder um so you know the emphasis really needs to be on constantly be in open water you want to be strong enough to pull uh and get your arm up quickly anchor it pull you know as science said just grip and rip um so i i would argue that that's one reason why fitness especially for triathletes and being strong is perhaps more important than they might realize just that open water swim uh just because of the conditions and those variables Ed? i would add uh, a couple more things to conrad you, you you're what you're saying stimulated some more thoughts for me but a simple analogy is think of riding your bike and um you know if you're on a long flat um road and you got a tailwind you're going to stay in one gear and just ride right but if you think of that if you think of taking that uh that same ride in a in a hilly curvy um you know route that you're taking you're going to be shifting gears all the time but in cycling you've got the gears it's right on the bike so in the open water swimming scenario it's it's really important to somehow identify the gears that you're going to need and then and then practice getting those gears into your swim so increasing your stroke rate um knowing to breathe uh, you know if you're if you're if the waves are coming at you on one side you, you better you, you know on your left side you better darn well better be able to breathe on your right side so practicing all of these things um practicing some combat swimming you know if you can get a group of people and like swim really close to each other and even even you know tap each other's legs and bump each other a little bit and you know, get used to those things. Um, so it's, you know, e even just psychologically so that you're prepared. If someone knocks your goggles off, what are you going to do? Um, if you swallow some water, what are you going to do? And practice these things over and over again, because again, that preparation uh, leads to, you know, calm and confidence when it does happen to you, because it will happen. Yeah, it absolutely will. Uh, that, that is <laughs> that, that is for sure. And uh, yeah, I really agree with with all of those points. Just one follow up to Conrad's uh, discussion around building strength. I just wanted you to clarify a bit uh, what type of strength you mean specifically and how to to build that. Sure. So uh, the most important muscles during swimming is it, it's the lats are probably the most important um and then just really you need to be strong everywhere especially your core um even your neck muscles need to be strong in open water because you're going to be lifting your head to sight fairly often so you do need to be strong head to toe um the, uh, as to them here i think we lost conrad yes can okay. you hear me uh, d d yeah i would i would just a couple of me? things i would add to what conrad is saying there is that you know, uh, the, the propulsive muscles are the large muscles of the back and the, the, lat, the, the latissimus dorsi. But connecting those, I, I believe in freestyle, it's so important to learn how to connect those big propulsive, propulsion muscles with having this long, taut body line, but also the, the, the muscles in the torso used in rotating. So when you rotate at the catch, you're driving that opposite hip down you know, toward the bottom of the pool or, or whatever, and really accessing these massive muscles in the torso that can, that can really help you get that anchor um, so that your body's not doing a serpentine or anything like that. It holds its body line and reduces drag. Um, 
that I think that's um, super important. The other thing that I think is really important that people can do, whether they, it's better to practice this probably on land, but is building the strong core and torso muscles. So you can hold that, that long taut body line. Um, and I think in this day and age where, where most of us spend a lot of time seated, that we're, that's counterproductive for um, maintaining a very strong functional uh, core and torso. So to me, those are very important and they go hand in hand. The, the propulsive muscles, muscles as well as the, the torso and core muscles that hold, help you hold your alignment, um, not just alignment in terms of the s- reducing serpentine motion of the body, but even the up and down. You know, if you have a, if your body again is like a vessel, like a a, bo- a, a boat, and it's, and your the bow of the boat is up, and and the the stern of the boat is down, that's just more drag. You want to be able to get your body and the hull of the boat to be pretty much parallel to the bottom of the pool <laughs> or the surface of the water as much as you can, because the more your your legs are tipped down the more drag you're going to have, the slower you're going yeah, to go. Yeah, I think those are great points. And uh, it just uh, reminds me of the old adage of you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. Uh, we had another canoe example before, but uh, where a good sort of carbon fiber light canoe is is good. But in this sense, when it comes to the core strength, you, you really want to be more like a, a ship out of the Navy to, to be able to, to transfer that propulsive power that you're generating through your body and actually move move forward uh, so so yeah absolutely uh, conrad is back it seems uh, do you want to finish your thread of thought there on strength now we can't hear conrad um right well um we can thank him anyway thank you conrad and we'll have the links to his website and uh, everything social media in the show notes and rob do you want to tell the listeners where they can find and follow you and follow vasa and uh, then finally give the name of the book again and uh, so that <laughs> listeners can find that too sure uh okay the best if, if they want to know more about vasa come to uh, vasatrainer.com it's v a s a trainer.com um, we also are on various social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. We have a great YouTube channel if anybody's interested in, in instructional videos for technique. Um, and the name of, of Conrad and my uh, book is called Triathlon Freestyle Simplified. Right now it's available on Amazon and you can buy it as a Kindle book or you can buy it as a paperback and um, I suppose if someone really wants an autographed copy, they should contact either me or Conrad and we can arrange that. But we're not selling the book ourselves per se. It's we, We're trying to direct everybody to the Amazon uh, website to buy the books. And, they can, and, and they're available internationally. So it's not just with the US Amazon. You can you can buy them in other countries and everything will be linked in the show notes of course so thank you so much rob and uh, conrad thank you again i don't know if you can hear me or if the connection is still connection issue is still ongoing but uh, it was a pleasure having you both on and uh, yeah look forward to digging into the book very soon well thank you very much it's always a pleasure to talk with you and i wish you all the best i hope that you enjoyed that interview as always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com with all the links that we mentioned. And uh, I highly recommend that you check out uh, Rob's and Conrad's book, Triathlon Freestyle Simplified Swim Stronger, Better, Faster on Amazon. You'll find the link in the episode description and in the show notes. You'll also find links to the websites of Conrad and Rob and to their previous episodes. Uh, because as mentioned during the interview, they have each appeared on the triathlon show before. Conrad in episode 202 called Training for Time Crunched Athletes with Conrad Geringer and Rob in episode 46, so that was some time ago, Develop Swim Technique and Power with the Vasa Trainer. 
So that's it for today. On Thursday, we have another Q&A coming out. And uh, next Monday, we have an exciting sports science topic with Dr. Mark Burnley. We'll discuss critical power and VO2 kinetics and maybe some other uh, goodies. So stay tuned for that. Stay subscribed to the podcast so you automatically get the show when it's released. If you are looking for training plans or coaching services, please go and check out scientifictriathlon.com. We would love to help you. And uh, based on the feedback that we're getting, uh, we're doing a pretty good job with that. So uh, if you are looking for those kinds of products and services, uh, scientifictriathlon.com is a great place to go. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and take their free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy for training and racing and get 15% off your order with the promo code DETTRAFLONSHOW15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with the promo code roka.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft long.